Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are from a cold and rainy Jerusalem. Until the 1880s, well over half of the Jews in the land of Israel were Sephardi and or came from Muslim countries. Eurocentric Jewish and Zionist historiographies, however, have often overlooked or marginalized these Jews and their activities. I was actually tempted to name this series The Jews in Late Ottoman Palestine and to discuss the Jews from the Middle East and North Africa somewhat as a contra to those books and lectures on the Jews of Palestine which focus only on the Ashkenazim with a few nods to the Sephardic population, who were in fact not only the majority of the Jewish population but also held the, all the positions of leadership in the officially recognized Jewish community until World War I. Over the course of these four lectures, we will, of course, mention Ashkenazim. However, they are not our focus. This four-part four series will shed lay, light on the multifaceted relationships of the Jewish communities in the Middle East and North Africa with the Holy Land and their presence in the land. Although the focus of the series will be on those Jews who are actually living in 19th and early 20th century Palestine, they retain their ties with the communities of their origin. And, and after all, Eretz Israel is an integral part of the Middle East. Each lecture will delve into one facet of this broad and rich subject, immigration to the land, the Sephardic Jewish communities in the plural in the land, Jewish women immigrating and coping with life in the land, and finally, a lecture examining each of the, com of the components in light of contemporary pol political and ideological developments in Israel, as well as current Jewish, Zionist, and Middle Eastern historiography. Each topic, of course, could constitute a mini-series in itself. Turning to today's presentation, I invite you to type your questions and comments into the chat during the course of my presentation, and tomorrow will read them out at the end. And if I don't get to all of them, I will try to answer them next time. After defining the geographic areas, political terms, and social concepts relevant to the study of the Middle East and North African Jews and Eretz Israel, I will briefly discuss the traditional links of Jews in the diaspora with the Holy Land. As over 90% of the Jews in 19th century Palestine had immigrated at some stage of their lives, I argue that it is not possible to understand the Jewish communities under the Sephardic leadership without studying where, why, and how they arrived in the land. I will therefore examine both how both external and internal Jewish political, economic, and social developments in the 19th and 20th centuries meshed with the religious milieu and impacted on Jewish migration, both within the Mediterranean basin and the rather, as well as the rather radical step of Aliyah, immigration to the land of Israel. Finally, I will map out how some, some of the travel routes taken by the immigrants the strategies with coping and root, and lastly, the demographic characteristics of the Olim, the immigrants themselves, which will lead us into next week's lecture on the Sephardic communities in Eretz Israel. A few words about the terminology I will be using. The Middle East and North Africa, Islamic lands or Muslim lands. In the introduction to a collection of articles entitled Family History in the Middle East, Bashara Dumeni, then professor at the University of California, Berkeley, wrote, quote, the Middle East is a constructed term that carries a great deal of unwelcome baggage. It is used here purely for convenience, end quote. And I will continue in the same vein. The Middle East refers to regions from the Eastern Mediterranean, including, or not including, Turkey and the Eastern part of North Africa, and extending to the Iraq-Iran border or further east to India, and north to some or all of the southern Russian regions. And each of these maps here present a different delineation of the area. Another term for the area which has been used historically by Europeans is the Levant, 
All these regions have a Muslim majority, although not Arab. In Arabic, the general area is known as the Mashriq, the east, and that differentiates it from the Maghreb, the west, which includes what was known as French North Africa and Libya, with Egypt being a border area between east and west, sometimes considered Maghreb, sometimes considered Mashriq. Jews from the Maghreb were known, were known as Maghrebim, or Maravim in Hebrew, Westerners, and those from the Mashriq, the East, as Mizrahim, Easterners. In today's lecture, I will focus on the southern and eastern Mediterranean basin, from Morocco in the West to Turkey, Syria, and Israel in the East. In next week's lecture on the Jews in late Ottoman Palestine, I will deal with North Africa and the Middle East more broadly, including Yemen, Bukhara, Persia, today's Iran, and more. Various terms were used for the region, which is more or less Israel today. And I will use all the terms interchangeably. In the 19th century, the area was divided politically into four Ottoman districts in the province of southern Syria, the borders of which underwent constant change. Christian Europeans called it the Holy Land, Terra Sancta, and from the 1870s on began to use a more secular term, Palestine, recalling Roman rule over the area. Muslims used many names for the different parts of the region, most often Asham, denoting southern Syria, including Eretz Israel. The name Philistine, or Palestine, began to be adopted only at the beginning of the 20th century, promoted by one of the early Arabic newspapers in the country, known by the same name. In Jewish literature, it is Zion, Zion, Eretz HaKodesh, the Holy Land, Eretz Israel, the Land of Israel, or in short, Haaretz, the Land. The lack of clarity regarding the borders and names of the country did not affect the overwhelming impact this small land had exerted throughout the centuries. As Tel Aviv University professor Gidon Bigo wrote, quote, the uniqueness of Eretz Israel derives from the fact that, a that large portions of humanity are linked to it historically and culturally. This land is not merely a small territorial segment of the globe, but a cultural entity exerting a profound cultural influence over very parts, various parts of the world. Hebrew University professor Eliezer Schweid of blessed memory, who died just three weeks ago, added the religious dimension. The uniqueness of the land of Israel is geotheological. This is the land which faces the entrance of the spiritual world, that the sphere of its existence lies beyond the physical world known to us through our senses. This 19th century map of Eretz Israel and many others over the centuries are quite different from the political maps and present the religious imagination of the country. Here, another example shows the prominence of uh, holy sites in Jerusalem and in Hebron, Tiberias, Meron, and Sfat. These maps of the Holy Land reveal the interplay of space and concept. Know that the 11th century Dome of the Rock is depicting the Holy Temple and the graves of Mishnaic and Talmudic rabbis for Tiberius. The Chinese American geographer Yi Fu Tuan developed the concept of geopiety, the reverence for and veneration of a particular place. This approach stresses the cultural and religious components of human actions and their relationships to physical space and place. Another American geographer, Robert Sack, has noted in his discussion in his book, Conceptions of Space in Social Thought, noted, sacred space is a system which is conceptually, but not actually separable from facts and their relationships. Since these works by geographers in the 1970s and 80s, a spatial turn has reinvigorated the humanities. Perhaps nowhere is this more clear 
and more true than the study of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. The land is both part and parcel of the Islamic Mediterranean world, having unique ties to Christian Europe, and part of world Jewish consciousness. In order to delineate the time period under discussion, Eretz Israel was under Ottoman rule for 400 years, from Suleiman the Magnificent's conquest in 1517 until the British arrived in 1917 during World War I. The Ottoman Empire developed from the mid-14th century and effectively put an end to the Byzantine Empire by, con by conquering Constantinople, today's Istanbul, in 1453. At its height, the Ottomans controlled much of Southeast Europe, Western Asia, and North Africa. The seat of government, combining sultanic and Islamic rule, was in Istanbul. Thus, the empire was commonly called Turkish. During the late, 19th and during the 18th, late 18th and 19th centuries, the Ottoman Empire was threatened by its European rivals and suffered temporary territorial losses. Together with internal changes, the Ottoman state began a comprehensive program of reform and modernization known as the Tanzimat, which among other things, revised the status of non-Muslims and gave certain rights to Jews. Over the course of the 19th century, the Ottoman state became vastly more powerful and organized internally despite further territorial losses. The Ottoman Empire came to an end in the wake of its alliance with Germany during World War I, and a new, much smaller Turkish nation state was created. Late Ottoman rule in Palestine, therefore, refers to the period of the 19th century through World War I. Although Jews constitute one people with one religion, over the centuries of their dispersion, Different traditions developed in their common heritage, reflecting their acculturation to different geographical, social, political, and religious environments. A general bifurcation of world Jewry developed in Europe under Christian rule were Ashkenazi Jews. In Muslim countries, where Ladino-speaking Jews had been expelled from Spain, Svarad, during the 15th century and dispersed throughout the Mediterranean world, and beyond, including smaller numbers in Christian Europe and the Western Hemisphere, as well as Jews speaking a variety of Judeo-Arabic languages already living in those regions for centuries, each with their own customs and traditions. In, Eastern, in the Eastern Mediterranean, the Sfaradim, those exiled from Spain, reinvigorated the Jewish communities and dominated them. In some areas of North Africa, separate communities of the exiled Sfaradim and the native Jewish inhabitants, the Toshavim, were maintained. In other areas, there was a blend of religious and cultural uh, uh, mores. Until the last decades of the 19th century, Ladino-speaking Jews, primarily from Turkey and the Balkans, constituted a clear majority in the Holy Land. Although a substantial presence of North African or Maghrebin Jews existed over the centuries. As the Jewish population of late Palace, Ottoman Palestine rapidly expanded and diversified due to Aliyah from all over the Jewish world, with growing numbers of Jews from North Africa, Yemen, Bukhara, Kurdistan, Persia, and other areas, were often lumped together in a general category of Sephardic Jews, although not always by choice. Over time, these Middle Eastern Jews, sometimes called Oriental Jews, or in Hebrew, Edota Mizrach, were also called Svaradim, differentiating them from the Ashkenazi Jews, a practice still common today. This diversity, lack of uniformity, and confusion in the terminology used for these different groups among Sephardic Jews adds to the complexity of studying Jewish communities, especially in Israel and makes research of non-Ashkenazi and non-elite Sephardic communities complex and often ambiguous, as will dis be discussed in more detail in the following lectures. These terms, as well as uh, the geographic terms of Middle East, for example, 
are constructed and fluid and flexible. But I hope a general explanation helps clarify a rather tangled and murky use of words. The deep attachment of Jews in Muslim lands to the Holy Land has been studied primarily through texts of a written corpus of Jewish law and philosophical writings. Daily prayers and special liturgy for holidays and special occasions reinforced ties. Next year in Jerusalem, Lishana Ba'ab Yushalayim, Jerusalem maintained its centrality in Jewish prayer and became a synonym for all the land of Israel and a symbol of the ultimate return of Israel from exile, detached from the earthly city. However, in Jewish law, the holiness, as defined by the laws and commandments, applies to the country as a whole. There are laws applicable exclusively to the Holy Land, such as special regulations from the book of Leviticus for cultivating the land, portions left for the poor, and the sabbatical Shemitah year observed in Israel this year. In fact, the basic precept of settling the land, Yeshuv Ha'aretz, has been enumerated as a separate religious commandment, a mitzvah. The social and religious ties are also anchored in customs imbued with a love of Zion and messianic, messianic longings. Often, these are more pervasive than the intellectual study, as breaking a glass as a reminder of our sorrow at the destruction of the temple, at a, at destruction of the temple at a joyous occasion as weddings. Sites mentioned in the Bible, the Mishnah, and the Talmud are held in special esteem. Over the centuries, the dynamics of religious behavior, geographic mobility, and access to the perceived past not only reinforced attitudes and relationships to the land, but created specific holy sites. The custom of visiting graves, a practice known from the early Middle Ages, was considered not only an act of piety, but became a desirable form of behavior in order to commune with the departed pious, to request intervention and to absorb some of his qualities. Over time, such grave sites themselves became sacred spaces. Beginning in the 16th century, a mystical tradition within Judaism, the Kabbalah, developed primarily in the northern city of Tzfat and to a lesser degree in Tiberias. Among the Kabbalistic customs practice was the veneration of the many rabbis and sages buried in the Galilee or reputedly buried there, such as those we saw in the picture before or the map or the religious imagination of a map of Tiberias. The mystical doctrines emanating from Tzfat found fertile ground in North Africa and the Middle East. Sages devoted themselves to studying the writings of the Kabbalah. Community members participated in ritual readings of its classical text, the Zohar, uh, traditionally believed to have been written by Rabbi uh, Simon Bar Yochai in Meron near Tzfat during the second century. Traditional ties to Israel became imbued with sparks of the divine, which gave every man and woman an active part in the coming messianic redemption. The sites of Tiberias and Spa became personally familiar to the Jews of the Mediterranean through word and picture, stories, poetry, and song. Rabbi David ben Hassin, a popular 18th century Paitan of Meknes, Morocco, for example, wrote Piyotin, a poetic liturgy, in honor of Tiberias and Spa. And these were adopted in synagogue liturgy throughout North Africa and even in Tiberias and Sfat themselves. Sermons and writings emphasized Israel's special sacred status, meshing standard traditional terms and Kabbalistic concepts. However, these ties did not usually culminate in migration to a land fraught with earthly poverty, insecurity, and general neglect. Aliyah, literally going up or ascent, expresses intrinsic merit and virtue and not only physical movement, and is a term quite different from that of mere migration, hagira. Interestingly, Aliyah has not been defined as a commandment in itself, 
but is understood to be a means to fulfill those commandments which can be performed only in the Holy Land. As such, Aliyah is both a physical and a spiritual means to attain greater, greater accessibility to the Holy. Customs imbued with the love of the land and messianic longings created social legitimacy for those leaving their communities and their extended families in order to go up to the Holy Land, particularly for women otherwise limited in their geographic mobility. According to tradition, this elevated level of sanctity promises the inhabitants of the Holy Land special benefits, health, longevity, an easier entry to the world to come, etc. Although I must add parenthetically that these virtues themselves illustrate the gap, even the contradictions between the reality and the perceived notions of sanctity, especially in poverty-stricken, disease-ridden 19th century Palestine, in which the only sure attribute was a more speedy entry to the world to come. The heavenly Jerusalem, that of the mind and the heart, ignored the earthly Jerusalem, the physical attributes of the place. Again, we turn to Tuan's geopiety, the concepts of reverence for a physical place. However, in spite of the constant and deep attachment to the land and practice, not all Jews were interested in Aliyah, aside from, interested in Aliyah, aside from political and economic factors contributing to or preventing migration. Several solutions were created to deal with the religious dilemma. On the one hand, Jews in the diaspora reinterpreted commandments on a purely spiritual level, detached from the reality of the land. On the other hand, those men and women living in the land became the emissaries of their respected families and communities, as well as for the Jewish people as a whole. And through them, others were able to fulfill religious commandments in the land in absentia. This mission not only added special status and sanctity for those living in Zion, it also had monetary benefits. In order for Jews living outside the land to participate in life in the land, they sent contributions to the holy cities to, to sustain the communities in their continually distressing circumstances. The funds collected abroad for Jews living in the Holy Land, therefore, were not conceived of as charity alone, but as a token of this participation. Shadarim, pious men traveling as emissaries from the Holy Land primarily to collect monies, were also the, fun were also the functional connection between diaspora Jews and the land of Israel, bringing not only Torah Mitzinai, Torah Mitzion, the word of Torah from Zion, and current news, but also recalling mystical events and miracles as well. In the 17th and 18th century, these ties did not usually culminate in migration to a land fraught with insecurity and general neglect, but times were changing. In the 19th century, the traditional economy began to change in North Africa and the Middle East, along with European penetration and colonial rule. Local Jews were active in commerce and often became intermediaries and agents for European companies, attaining the, the desired protege or protected status, giving them special rights. European Jewish education, primarily that of the French Alliance Israelite Universelle, offered new opportunities for girls as well as for boys. Modernity took quite different forms from those developed in European Jewish societies, and the continuum between tradition, adaption, and acculturation was expressed in a myriad of ways. From the 1840s, there was a dramatic increase in Jewish migration within the region due to changes in economic pressures, physical insecurity, and political upheaval, as well as a periodic havoc wrought by drought and famine. From towns and villages in rural areas of Morocco, here as an example of the process in just about all the countries of the Middle East, Jews gravitated toward the larger interior cities, and from there, sorry, the animation 
mixed up the order first from the rural areas to the internal in, interior cities and then to the coast. And Jews streamed to the coastal cities in the hopes of finding economic opportunities and security under the aegis of foreign powers. However, the Barbary pirates were not just figments of the imagination and subjects of tales, they were real and a constant threat to coastal cities and movement on the Mediterranean. In the wake of the Napoleonic Wars at the beginning of the 19th century and French conquest of Algeria in 1830, piracy in the Mediterranean was eradicated and travel became safer, although still not without danger. In 1831, Rabbi Yaakov Verdugo, for example, pronounced that travel to the Holy Land no longer entailed, quote, certain and great personal danger, and therefore no longer justifies circumventing the commandment to settle in the land. After the 1830s, the Holy Land became a more viable option when steamship lines and communication links began to improve. Aliyah, immigration to the Holy Land of Jews from North Africa and the Middle East, increased, together with that of Ashkenazi Jews from Europe. By the end of the century, direct passage could also be found to Jaffa or Haifa. Travel was not only relatively safer with steamships and improved the security, but the duration of the trip was cut dramatically, and we will return to this later. Although many continued their search for a better life within the country of their birth or neighboring countries with perceived economic, social, and political advantages as French Algeria or Egypt, or immigration to Europe or South America, once migrations began, Aliyah too became a viable option for those seeking to fulfill their spiritual aspirations. Although this was not without pragmatic and ideological tensions, in Tetuan in the north of Morocco, for example, the illustrious Rabbi Yitzhak ben Walid was pressured to make only a brief pilgrimage to the Holy Land in 1877 in lieu of settling there permanently, so he might continue to lead the local community in coping with the increased pressures of modernization and rising population. Models of migration can, facil can facilitate the understanding of Aliyah. In traditional, as well as Zionist ideology, Aliyah was typically viewed as a simplistic push-pull, one-directional movement. In practice, the, the decision-making process was more complex, both in place of origin and destination, with factors was pushed and pulled in different directions. In this respect, Aliyah functioned as other migrations, albeit with many unique characteristics. Family bonds and accustomed surroundings tied potential migrants to their homes, in spite of adverse uh, circumstances. Shining opportunities, together with unknown dangers, awaited them in new environments. Sociologists and dem demographers began to develop models of migration in the 1960s, refining the laws of migration, which had, been dom which had dominated the study since their formulation at the end of the 19th century. Everett Lee introduced intervening obstacles to the push-pull model. These may include unexpected political restrictions, wars, economic crises, personal health and family issues, and interrupted the push-pull process. Subsequent scholars added psychological factors of stress and multiple outcomes. Sergio Della Pergola from Hebrew University offers a model reflecting the unique characteristics of an ethno-religious minority, as the Jews, versus a host society, taking into consideration personal and group characteristics and value systems, which are particularly relevant for a discussion of Aliyah. For most, excuse me, for most, external factors triggered the migration, as raids on Jewish quarters, new restrictions on taxes, economic, political, and physical insecurity, but their long dormant desire to go up to the Holy Land determined their direction, 
and their specific choice of destination within Israel was eminently connected to their own perceptions of sanctity of place and its part in their spiritual and worldly lives and aspirations. How did individual and group perceptions of sanctity and specific religious beliefs and practice influence Jews and their decisions to make the difficult journeys, going against all theory by traveling long distances to a lesser developed country with fewer economic opportunities to the Holy Land, which at the time was a peripheral and undeveloped area of the Ottoman Empire. Again, I turn to Tuan and Sak and integrate their approaches which stress the cultural and religious components of human actions and their relationship to physical space and place. Social factors, social factors and hometown networking snowballed, making timing and certain destinations even more attractive. As will be discussed next week, over half of the Maghreban Jews in the country settled in Svat and Tiberias alone. Jews from Turkey and the Balkans settled primarily in Jerusalem. Persian Jews formed their own quarter in Svat. Rabbi Yosef Mashash, in a personal introduction to his three-volume compendium of letters, Otsara Mikhtavim, gives a detailed and heart-rending description of the trials and tribulations of his family and community members over two centuries in their continued aspirations and actual efforts to go up to the land of Israel. I use this example from Morocco as an extreme case, as Morocco is one of the farthest in physical distance from Israel, but had the largest number of immigrants. It is also one of the few documents of its type. Rabbi Masas decides tribal wars, sudden restrictions and prohibitions, poor health, highway robbery after the actual departure of groups, delaying their trips along the way, sometimes for years, or even terminating them altogether. Here, I map one example from 1833 of a group of Jews leaving the Moroccan city of Meknes, known for its rich scholarship and intense love of Zion, to nearby Fez, from there to the border town of Ujda, to Tlemcen in, in Algeria, planning to go to the Lord, large port of Oran on the Algerian coast, and from there hoping to find a ship to Eretz Yisrael. The land portion alone took over three years, and still they hadn't arrived in Oran. At the beginning of the 19th century, a trip from Morocco to the Holy Land would take a minimum of six to, a minimum of six to eight months by caravans from the interior to a port, and then by sailing ships and packet boats making short uh, jaunts along the coast, many crossing the Mediterranean to ports on its northern, its northern coast, then back south to Alexandria or east to Istanbul, well over 4,000 kilometers or nearly 3,000 miles. Families were delayed, waiting for connections between modes of transportation and mishaps along the way. The immigrants usually traveled in family units requiring funds and logistics for housing and food along the way. Sometimes stops were extended in order to work, find work to pay for the remainder of the trip. Sometimes a family member fell ill and additional time was spent in one place before continuing. Obviously, the trip was much shorter, less expensive, and less arduous for those from Istanbul in Turkey, Salonika in Greece, or Alexandria in Egypt, and only a day or so from those from Damascus. But the obstacles which Jews from Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia faced did not prevent hundreds and thousands from setting out to the Holy Land. By the end of the 19th century, the same trip from the interior of Morocco to the ports of Jaffa or Haifa could take as little as three weeks, not only cutting time, but also expense and other obstacles along the way. Ships sailed from Gibraltar and Oran directly to Malta and from there to Palestine. Another route went directly to the new ports of, the new ports of Port Said at the entrance of the Suez Canal opened in 1869 or Beirut, and from there by packet boat traveling along the coast to Palestine. 
From the 1870s, shipping companies such as Lloyd's published regular schedules, including stops in Jaffa or Haifa. Changes in per personal status were dominant factors for individuals in their migration decision. Younger families often migrated after the death of parents, released from their obligations. Many widows who made Aliyah demonstrated not only the ultimate manifestation of their traditional love of Zion, but also their newly found independence. Traveling in family units and networking with others, making Aliyah, facilitated arrangements, negotiating for prices and space in caravans and on ships, procuring and sharing food, arranging for temporary accommodations, and guarding persons and property. I even found a few examples in which well-to-do families chartered a whole ship or sections of it for a, the entire group. However, it seems that the social and emotional support of a group was crucial for overcoming obstacles and route. This was most important for the many widows who traveled with their families or by themselves, as well as for the many families with young children. They banded together, supported each other, and found solace in times of need. Aliyah provided women in particular with active expressions of sanctity and higher levels of personal religiosity. In their home communities, most avenues in the synagogues or study halls were barred to them. The sanctity of living in the Holy Land, however, has no gender bias. Women also had proximity and access to the, whole, to the sacred, even if not equal, and thus could enhance their lives by non-formalized, non-institutional behavior as visiting the grave of the pious to pray. Family obligations and social restrictions on mobility prevented women from fulfilling these aspirations in their home communities, unless their husbands, too, endeavored to immigrate. Once widowed, however, they were free to act upon their own religious inclinations and migrate to the Holy Land, provided they had the economic means to do so. This type of geographic mobility for women in traditional society was not only allowed by rabbinical authorities and social attitudes, but was officially sanctioned as a good deed and even encouraged, although not only for spiritual reasons alone. Census lists from 19th century Palestine shows that Jews of all ages immigrated from North Africa and the Middle East, and it was not predominantly those wishing to die in the land in their old age. Although the very poor did not have the means for the journey, and the rich often but not always remained with their business interests and property, those immigrating generally came from the middle stratum. However, after the expenses of the journey, they arrived with few possessions and almost no money. With the difficulties of entering the Palestinian harbors, some even lost what remained. In conclusion, what static religious ties and a, excuse me, what caused static religious ties and a, and a traditionally passive love of Zion to evoke into a radical active expression of faith in the form of Aliyah? An especially vibrant atmosphere propounding the love of Zion and encouraging ties with the Holy Land in traditional normative terms, together with intensifying mystical tendencies, created unique perceptions of sacred space and their functions in daily life. Aliyah to the Holy Land became an active expression of belief, creating social trends and new networks. Additionally, when migrating to Eretz Israel, those Jews from the southern and eastern Mediterranean shores remained within the Muslim Ottoman context, generally familiar to them from their home communities. The dynamics of migration do not break down into neat push-pull dichotomies. Neither do the experiences of Jewish immigrants suffer neat distinctions between heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem. The earthly was sacred and the spiritual was physical. They continue to see the objective and the tangible through their mind's eyes. But in fact, it often clashed and new strategies had to be, had to be 
created to cope with the new realities. Although often confronted with the conflict between place and faith, these immigrants made a significant impact on the landscape of the country, and that we will examine next week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Benyako, uh, for taking us back to past years. Um, if there's any questions from the audience, this is time to use the chat. Um, we did have one a comment here from Dina wanted to let us know she was born in Benghazi and moved to Israel in 1948. I'm sure there are many others here who are uh, hoping to hear about their family history. Um, while we wait for a question to turn up, do you want to give us a few words about um, what we could be expecting next week? Well, next week we're talking about those who actually arrived, not only wanted to arrive, wanted to travel, not only who traveled but didn't quite make it, but those who actually arrived. I just might add parenthetically that there are communities along the way, for example, in um, Alexandria, where there are a large number of Moroccan, Algerian, and Tunisian Jews living there that got that far on the way and their money stopped or somebody was sick and they stayed there and they ended up staying there for a couple of generations before most of them finally made it to Israel at one point or another. Um, so we're talking about the communities and I would like to stress this, um, not only a semantic problem, but an actual problem of this sort of like Everyone who's not Ashkenazi becomes Sephardic, but that's, that's not really the case because people wanted, had their own traditions and their own identity. So it was a matter of all migration creates new identities. So we'll look at some of these new identities. For example, there was no Tunisian identity or a Moroccan identity. People identified with their hometown or their, their region. Suddenly, when they arrive in a new country, they become, all of them, from Morocco through Tunisia, they become Mugrabin, okay? And the same thing as Sfaradim. The Ladino-speaking Sfaradim sort of were always on the borderline. Are they retaining their, their identity from Salonika, for example, or from Rhodes? Are they sort of this homogenized or trying to homogenize some kind of Sephardic um, identity. Then we get to ones that are, we didn't discuss today, those that came from uh, today's Iraq or Iran, from Persia or traditional Babylonia, from Yemen. Where do they fit in? They certainly aren't theoretically Sephardim. They aren't from the exiles from Spain. They had their own tradition, but they ended up being under the general aegis of the Sephardic community. So we have a power play here of who has the money, who has the finances, who has the power, and how does that play out on the ground? Where do they live? Do they live together? Do they live separately? And we will be looking not only at Jerusalem, we will be looking also at Tiberias, Safed, um, the new port cities of Haifa and Jaffa, and see how all these tensions play out in each of the places. So um, regarding what you just said, Isaac wants to know, where did the term Mizrahi come into play? Okay, so we have, as I mentioned, those coming from the east, meaning east of Israel, say, okay? Many of them, we have many um, that their last name, for example, is Mizrahi, East. They came from the, from the Islamic East, the Mashrik. Okay, so, but how do, how do those from North Africa who are in the West end up becoming East, you know? So we do have those coming from the East. And then, so that term started being used for everyone who wasn't a Ladino-speaking Spanish exile Sephardi, they started using the term Eastern. And then with a lot of 19th century colonial um, Orientalism, so Orient is East, so sometimes they were called Oriental. So is that because of colonial power of Oriental and the other? 
where we're talking about east, where does the east begin and where does the east end? You know, so we have sometimes this um, use of eastern or Mizrahi, and, and the terms are all very fluid. So, you know, so you get people from Algeria being called Mizrahi, but they're from the west. So, you know, so it's sort of this combination. It's not only sort of an academic uh, exercise in what to call, but the documents themselves use different terms. So it's really sort of a mix and match and you figure it out who we're talking about when we're trying to name these different groups. So as long as you go to small and smaller group, it's easier to find out who are Persian Jews or who are Yemenite. But of course, the Yemenite themselves don't consider themselves our at the stage of migration, aren't Yemenite. They're either from Tsana or they're from Damari or they're from some other place. So again, we have new identities being formed. Okay, and there's some questions about numbers. Gila wants to know what percentage of those who came went back to their uh, original homes. During the 19th and early 20th century, as well as in the 20th and 21st century, that's one of the million dollar questions. Mm -hmm. We really don't know. During the 19th, early 20th century that I'm talking about, there's two problems. The first problem is logistics. It was, poverty was dominant, so you had to have money to leave. So, that was one thing that, one aspect that prevented them. The other thing is we, I have several, doc, several um, sources showing that um, you weren't supposed to talk about it. I mean, something that in Israel only today people are really beginning to talk about it, but you don't talk about that, you know? So um, there are several um, folk tales as well as documents saying, don't tell us things are bad because you're, you're, you're getting out, um, how do you say, uh, you shouldn't say bad things about Israel. So therefore you don't say that it's poverty and I didn't have food and therefore I left. And we have one uh, folk tale that um, one, one uh, man uh, couldn't go to Israel so he saved up money, sent his father. His father was in Israel for a while, came back. And he said, well, you know, there's only rotten tomatoes. There's nothing, you know, what can you eat there? You know, so the, the, the son says, oh, you know, it's not the fragrance has to cleave to the spirit of Jerusalem and you're going to live in, you know. So there's all these stories. There's, story, there's another letter which somebody wrote a letter um, decrying the poor situation in Israel. And he was, and the son was ordered to rip up the letter and not tell anybody about it. So they shouldn't have the, the bad word, the hotsa'at dibata aretz, shouldn't be spread. So these sort of things prevent us from actually knowing people coming back, people leaving. And um, Hannah wants to know if, um, this is regarding people coming, not leaving, did Jews who made aliyah come due to, come for religious reasons or were they persecuted or persecution? For? Redifa, um, persecution. I didn't hear the end of it. Sorry, did they feel, in, did they make aliyah because they felt in danger in their homeland countries or for religious reasons? Well, it's always a matter of both. You know, they came for religious reasons. If it was just because of danger in their home communities, so maybe they went to another community nearby or further, further afield that offered more protection. Because sometimes a lot of the um, insecurity or problems or riots or, uh, or, um, eh, were rather local in nature. So they could go, you know, say, you know, 60 or 100 kilometers away and settle in a nearby city and be in a better situation. Um, but once they're getting up and leaving already, leaving their home communities, so the religious ties um, and created, uh, and made the direction of their movement. But there are also others that we have one rather um, uh, interesting fellow that you know did all kinds of things uh, 
I don't know, uh, you know, making a bad name for himself, you know. So then he sort of went to the Holy Land both to escape the authorities far away and also to try and retrieve a good name by doing a good deed of uh, coming to the country. The country in the 19th, early century was so poor, nobody was coming for economic opportunities, that was for sure. But they did hope to make a living. So we have many merchants, for example, coming and settling in Haifa and Jaffa, where they felt that they could, you know, in these new ports, make a living and simultaneously be in the Holy Land. So it's sort of not a one or the other, but a combination of factors. Okay, um, could you give examples of, that, of how those moving to Eretz Israel changed their surnames? Um, it sounds like it's a question of Ben-Gurions after the State of Israel questions when they changed their name to uh, good Hebrew names instead of what other names were in, uh, in, in the diaspora. But if we're talking about the 19th and early 20th century, um, most Sfaradim did have last names already from, that they came with and um, continued to use them. Others, you know, weren't particularly attached or didn't have a last name or weren't attached to them and used either nicknames or the names of the place they were from. I gave before the example of Jews, their, their last name is Mizrahi. Now, in their country of origin in the East, it wouldn't have been Mizrahi because everybody was Mizrahi, okay? But they needed, they had a last name or how they were known, you know? Somebody is the son of so-and-so or, you know, or from a certain place. So we have all kinds of last names, both those originally and those that indicate where they came from. It's not until after the State of Israel, somewhat in the mandate period in the Zionist Yeshuv, um, in the Zionist uh, circles, that um, Jews would change their names from wherever, whether it was Ashkenazi or Sephardi, it didn't matter what, to something that was more purely Hebrew. But that's not uh, something we see in the 19th, early 20th century. I think we'll take one last question. My apologies to those who we can't uh, answer right now. And if uh, this is something you're going to speak about in a later se session, let me know. Naomi wants to know, you ex explained before about the reasons for the Aliyah of the Sephardi Jews and how is it different from the Aliyah from Eastern Europe um, where life for Jews was uh, different? Well, that's, you know, a whole new ball game trying to compare the two. You, you know, you have to going to study one and study the other and then compare them. Um, there are two things I think that facilitated Sephardic Jews. One is, as I mentioned, they're in the same general cultural um, political sphere of the Islamic and um, Ottoman Empire. So they sort of knew how to deal, knew how to do commerce, knew how to to live with the conditions, the, not only the political conditions, the economic, even the food. You know, uh, how many Jews in Russia knew about eggplant or whatever, you know? So um, that I think it was less unsettling. The other thing is that the Kabbalah um, uh, took ground and developed after the Spanish exile when it was sort of a, um, a spiritual means of overcoming this severe trauma. And that was definitely connected with Israel so that there was also this spiritual connection. Because of course, if we're talking about prayers, if we're talking about the Bible, the prayers and a lot of the laws, it's the same thing, whether it's Ashkenazi or Sephardic. But there was a much stronger um, Israeli component in the um, Islamic world towards Israel. And some of it is because of the trauma of the Spanish exile. Um, Ashkenazi rabbis tended to sort of raise the, the, the actual laws of the land and the laws of being in Israel to much more spiritual aspects. 
so that there was a way that you could achieve all these things living in the diaspora, living in exile, because you were dealing with them spiritually and not actually. So that, that gave them more of an, I wouldn't say incentive to say, or say less of an incentive to leave, because here they could fulfill all these uh, mitzvot while they're still in, in the diaspora, something that in mostly in the Sephardic world, they didn't accept that attitude. 